Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Gastro Girl Podcast. Today, we're going to talk with an amazing patient advocate, but more importantly, she is the founder and CEO and a leader in this space, Ms. Donna Cryer. She's founder and CEO of the Global Liver Institute and a 28-year liver transplant survivor. And I couldn't think of a better person to talk with us today about why we should care about our liver. This is this is an important episode. Thank you so much, Donna, for joining us today, and I'm so grateful to meet you. Thank you. It is a uh, another item I can check off my bucket list that I have been on the Gastro Girl podcast. So thank you. Oh, I didn't know if I was ever going to be on anyone's bucket list, but you've made my day. <laughs> <laughs> I had to create one because I've had some really remarkable experiences, uh, it's, particularly since I turned 50. And so I, I had to create a bucket list just to put cool things on it. Well, you are an inspiration. And before we get into the meat and potatoes of this amazing discussion today, your story is so inspiring and it's really uh, very profound. Um, and I, I'd like you to just kind of tell, share with our audience um, how you came to found the Global Liver Institute. Well, my path uh, definitely came through uh, conditions that many of your listeners are already very familiar with. I was diagnosed at age 13 uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. We first called it ulcerative colitis, um, but it, it became uh, so severe. Uh, I developed uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, a rare autoimmune liver disease um, that goes into scar the bile ducts. And so in a certain percentage of patients with IBD, um, they do develop uh, liver diseases. And that's one of the first things I, I really want people to know um, that if you have uh, an inflammatory bowel disease that you need to have your doctors be looking at your liver as well. Um, and so for me, uh, I was becoming so ill. Um, the cells of my colon were starting to show signs of cancer, um, high grade dysplasia, um, would be the official official terms. And so I had to have uh, my colon removed because we knew when once I went on immunosuppressants for my liver transplant, if I did develop liver cancer or colon cancer, that it would just there would be nothing we could do. It would just go through my body um, unchecked. And so we removed my my colon. I wore an ostomy bag for a year. So shout out to the ostomates. Um, I was one of you for a time. And then uh, my uh, liver did, did fail. And so um, in a very adventurous summer at Johns Hopkins, uh, going in and out of medical and surgical intensive care, I ended up in the ICU uh, and they told my mother I had seven days to live. And oh I'm glad they didn't tell me that I, I, I was, I was on a, just a more hopeful, faithful, uh, plan. And, um, that, that proved to be the right, the right attitude. Um, and we how, were old, how old were you then? I was 24. Oh, wow. You're so um, so I was between first and second years of law school. And so grateful to my law school classmates who, you know, braved the ICU to come and sit with me and um, tell me their woes and their struggles <laughs> um, and treating me like, uh, you know, the person that I had always been. I, so I will never, uh, I will always be grateful for those folks um, who ignored all of the lines and the machines and just talked to me about how hard it was to interview for law firm jobs and, and, and things like that. Um, but we were able to find a donor for me and, uh, and I, you know, am able to, to live here and, 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 and tell the tale. Um, many people do not have that opportunity. Well, thank you for sharing. That's a very, I don't even have words. I mean, it's almost surreal that you went through all of that. And 
what is so fantastic is that you were able to take that experience and do what you're doing now. And uh, in 2014, right, you founded the Global Liver Institute. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization and what inspired you and obviously your journey, but what really <laughs> prompted you besides your personal experience, like to do something on a bigger level? Yes. So I didn't go directly from having my own experience to saying, I need to found my own organization. Um, It was 20 years of working professionally in healthcare, for-profits, non-profits, clinical trial recruitment firms, uh, consulting firms, um, public relations firms, uh, things that would later come in handy. But I was really in a period of, of prayerfulness and mindfulness in recognizing the milestone that was the 20th anniversary of my transplant. Um, So not only do most people not get a transplant in the first place, um, they don't make it to 20 years, uh, certainly not with the same liver chugging away, doing all the 500 wonderful things that the liver does. And so I recognized that uh, I, I needed to do more to ensure that other people uh, experience the same uh, success with uh, putting all of these pieces of healthcare together, and you know, tried as I might to you know volunteer or work with other organizations, um, it really became clear that uh, an organization didn't exist that did all the things that I I, I felt really deep in my in my spirit. Um, was needed. And so with the help of some wonderful hepatologists, I created the Global Liver Institute because liver disease is a global problem. Uh, 1.5 billion people are living with some form of liver disease. And so it made no sense to, to think small. That's not what I was, you know, trained or born or raised to do. Um, and so, um, and that was also the gap that there were, there were and are wonderful organizations operating on specific types of liver diseases in, in the U.S. or many different countries, but they weren't working together. Um, and there wasn't anybody that was stepping up and taking accountability for putting liver disease and most more importantly, liver health on the map the same way that cancer or heart disease or brain health were. And so I felt that that was really the the movement that needed to be started that would benefit everyone with every type of liver disease and all the hardworking people in, in all of these organizations. Now, before we get into all the wonderful things that your organization does, I want to kind of take a break here and let's let's put into context why we should care about the liver. Like you've had this experience, your personal experience, but for those listening, I think the liver doesn't get enough enough love personally. I think people don't even realize, right? We talked about this a little earlier, that it's part of the digestive system and Mm -hmm. it plays a huge role in our overall health and wellness. So I want to hear it from the expert you, why should we care about our liver? Um, I will, I, I'm going to use this opportunity to actually, to give my favorite answer from one of my, uh, favorite, favorite people, because yes, I usually go around and nobody knows or cares anything about the liver. I happened to run into Donna Karen and, uh, the designer and, uh, and I told her, you know, I run the global liver Institute and she stopped me and she said, Oh, well, of course, the liver is so important. The liver is central to everything. And I about swooned that <laughs> Donna Karen knew and thought that the liver was, was important. And so that, that made my day. Um, so it is recognized in, in some circles, but the, the liver is central to 500 different functions. Um, you wouldn't be processing uh, sugar and converting it into energy if not for your liver. You wouldn't be making hormones if not for your liver. It filters. Um, it does um, all so many amazing things. And you only have one. I think that's what I want people to take away. You only have one, um, unlike your lovely kidneys. Um, you only have one liver. And so uh, without it, um, you, you simply die. Um, and, and so that's why it's important to, um, to love your liver, to appreciate your liver, to do things that promote liver health, because everything that you eat and drink and, and process to, to live is dependent on a high functioning liver. 
what can we do better to really love our liver and really take care of its overall health? Like, what can we do? What can we do, Donna? You can drink coffee. So, yes. So the literature on coffee um, is very strong um, and and very sound. And so coffee um, not only promotes liver health, but can in some cases reverse uh, fibrosis. So that doesn't mean 20 cups a day. Um, (laughs) And it doesn't mean in the, it doesn't mean caffeine in the form of diet Cokes and things like that. It means coffee. Um, there are also great benefits from teas, um, black tea, green tea, even white tea extracts, um, all have elements in them that, uh, protect the liver cells. So when you get up in the morning, most of us are doing something that is helping our liver. So we can, we can feel good about ourselves from right there. Oh, that's great. And in terms of eating and, you know, and I know that COVID and some of these other situations in the last several years have really impacted our ability to do good things for ourselves, um, such as exercise and eating right. What are some of, I mean, and we we can say we know this, but we really need to hear it again. What are some of the things we can do um, lifestyle wise to Mm -hmm. protect our liver? Or maybe, you know, can something like fatty liver disease be reversed or lessened? Like, what can we do? And that seems to be a big thing right now is fatty liver because of obesity, correct? It is. You are absolutely right. So unfortunately, uh, fatty liver disease has uh, risen with trends in obesity and type two diabetes. And so um, that threesome are very close friends and we need to break them up. Um, And so (laughs) and so the the best way to do that really it's it's a it's about reducing your intake of, of concentrated sugars is, is the most important thing. Um, it's, it's really less about fat than it is about sugar, um, is, is the, is the twist in the story, twist in the plot. Um, and so, uh, the good thing is that the things that you are doing to, uh, to lose weight, um, to reduce obesity, um, to, you know, reverse or prevent type two diabetes, to um, take care of your heart are the same things that um, improve your liver health. So drinking lots of water, um, eating less refined sugars, eating you know more fiber and salads without all the all the fa- fancy dressing on them. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have a lot of family in the South, so I want to be specific about what a salad is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> salad is a thing with the leafy greens. <laughs> and it, uh, that type of salad and, um, and, and, and things that, uh, increase your fiber. So, you know, in a, in a day I eat a lot of, um, oatmeal in the morning and will add flax seed and chia seeds and things like that to increase the fiber. Um, there are all sorts of sneaky ways, even for people with digestive diseases, that sometimes we think, oh, fiber is not our friend, but it is. And there are ways to um, to incorporate it in a way that is easy on our digestive systems, but is really just so necessary um, to proper digestive function. And that includes uh, liver function. And a lot of the things that we really encourage is for patients who are unsure about if they have a digestive condition Mm -hmm. is to work with a dietitian or their healthcare provider who can best guide them on things to maybe if they can't have a traditional source of fiber, like flaxseed, maybe there's something else that their body can tolerate. Right. So don't be afraid or don't think that you can't incorporate fiber. It's best to talk with your dietitian or your healthcare provider who knows your um, health situation best. Yeah. Somebody who really specializes in working with people with digestive disorders, because often, you know, regular dietitians don't understand what's necessary for us and, and, and why we may be, um, have, have prior trauma <laughs> from, uh, you know, from, from different, from different foods, depending on our, our GI history. And so, you know, soups are our friends, you know, your blender is your friend, 
Um, and so, you know, as there are, you know, non-dairy types of yogurt, you may be able to reintroduce, you know, uh, uh, probiotics and things to help your microbiome. And so all of those things, uh, it can be done. And there are folks who care enough about us um, and are getting, you know, extra training uh, to be able to do nutrition for us. Um, and it's so important in, in fatty liver to be able to have someone who understands um, obesity medicine and and nutrition for people with digestive um, conditions. And, and I'm excited that there are more and more of those every day, whether they're within so-called fatty liver disease clinics or um, increasingly in, in, in private practice. Yeah. And we also like to tell our listeners uh, you know, on GI on demand with the ACG, we have programs, some programs that aren't like a diet, like you have to restrict your food, but it's a way of eating like registered dietitian right. Niha Shah did a beautiful webinar and a subsequent um, three part series on the Mediterranean diet and how that could mm -hmm. help with with fatty liver with patients that are struggling with that. And it's right. not restrictive. And, if, you know, I'm Italian and French, so I'm all about the Mediterranean way of eating. Right. And again, a salad is a salad. It's not always it's all salads aren't created equal. So you definitely want to uh, look at the ingredients for that. Right. There's no jello involved. <laughs> There's no potatoes. <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> no mayonnaise. Um but you can do things you, really cool things with yeah. Greek yogurt, right? Instead you of you know using great mayonnaise. things with Greek yogurt, great things with olive oil. Um you have four different types of olive oil down down downstairs in the kitchen. And so um you can you can have fun with food. Um it can be your friend. Um, but, uh, you, we have to be, we have to be more thoughtful and mindful about it than most people. Um, and that's okay. Yeah. And also look for experts, you know, not everybody on Instagram or social media is a GI registered dietitian or a gastroenterologist or expert. Uh, so be careful of the information that you're consuming. Um, it could take you down a path that could be more harmful than good, especially if it's very restrictive or if it involves supplements. Mm -hmm. Right, Donna? Like, you know, right. supplements, we don't think about all the things we're taking that could have an effect on our liver as well. Absolutely. And supplements are not regulated in the same way that uh, medications are by the Food and Drug Administration. And so there's a lot of variation in supplements. Some of them don't have what they say they have in them. Um, and so make sure that you're working with someone who uh, recommends a specific brand to you um, and a specific, you know, uh, types of supplements. I remember one of my gastroenterologists is saying, well, you have very expensive urine. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, the supplements I do take now are, you know, are certain brands of, of turmeric and, um, and certain things that I take for my bones of calcium and vitamin D, um, that I remember taking to, I took all, every, my whole back to Mayo Clinic, um, and, and had the gastroenterology team there go through and said yes to this, no to that, yes to this, you know, I thought they were going to take them all away, but they did didn't, you know, some supplements were really, really helpful. And so they let me keep, you know, my turmeric and my fish oil, certainly my iron, uh, my calcium, my vitamin D, my zinc and, and things like that. So um, we're not against supplements. It's just no. which type and when um, and, and make sure you're taking them also in a way where you're absorbing them um, in the best way possible. Take your iron with some uh, with some vitamin C, you know, food or or, or otherwise. Um, don't take it with your calcium because they conflict with each other. So you know, really be smart about your supplements as well as you try to optimize your health. Um, and would you say the best way to do that is to really, like you did, talk to your healthcare provider because yes. some things work synergistically and some things, you know don't work so well and then can cause uh, more harm than good. So you definitely want to, and don't be embarrassed. They've seen it all. We've had numerous doctors and experts on here um, and they all say the same thing. Don't be embarrassed. No question is a stupid question. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, be transparent and honest with your provider so they can give right. you the best guidance. Right. 
Um, I tell them everything that I do, even though I know like I'm going to get in trouble for that, <laughs> but they have to know, um, you know, I have to be completely honest. Um, and so, you know, I talk with, you know, other patients, let's call them my mother, um, about, you know, your medical weight and your medical height. I'm like, I don't need to know your, your government weight and height. I need to know your medical weight <laughs> and height, you know, the reality base because your life depends on it. So be as honest as if your life depends on it um, is, is really important. Also, you're helping your doctor understand um, what may be barriers that you figured out how to overcome that then they can pass on to the next patient. Um, and so think about helping other patients, you know, through your provider of ways that you have figured out how to accommodate um, your, your medical, uh, you know, regimen. Um, certainly while I, I travel a lot. And so, uh, you know, learning how to take prednisone as the time zones changed oh, um, interesting. was, you know, was was a struggle, struggle for me, you know, at, at, at first. And so, um, you know, those are things that I talked about with my doctor. You know, I talk about how I use the scale that I have that gives my percentage of hydration um, to you know, uh, anticipate when I, um, am, am too, am too dehydrated and need to have a liter of fluid. Um, and that's something that in the years past without that tool, I would just end up in the ER. I'm sure many of your listeners have just for, you know, lack of some salt water. Um, wow. But, you know, you wait until you're, you know, really, really sick and then your, you know, your kidneys can shut down. It's everything from it's hard to get a line in, uh, in your vein at, when you're dehydrated to, you know, your cognitive function suffers, your liver is suffering, your kidneys are suffering, your GI tract um, is, is, is suffering, um, you're losing your appetite, all because you're dehydrated. Um, and so with something as simple as a home scale, you can keep track of that yourself and, and raise the red flags. And, you know, I, I need to I need to get a, a liter of fluid um, before things start to really decline or just, you know, work really hard on on drinking orally. If that still you know works for you, if you still have time, um, you know, and there are many different or rehydration solutions, liquid IV and drip drop are several that, that I use and, uh, and other people use to help uh, their absorption um, of, of fluids and just ways to keep us out of trouble. But sharing those with a doctor means that they can pass those along to other patients. Yeah, and hydration is important not only for our whole body, but the liver too, because that helps right. process um, some of those you know, just what's going on with the body and cleaning, cleaning and doing its Absolutely. job of removing toxins. So you definitely if it wanna... doesn't have water, it can't filter things out filter, yeah. and the toxins will build up. Now let's talk about another thing that a lot of people <clears throat> sure. um, indulge in is alcohol. Now there's, you know, many schools of thought, there's evidence, you know, we did a podcast last year with Dr. Quo and it was mm -hmm. a lot, it was very eye opening on what mm -hmm. consists of a serving of alcohol for men and yeah. women, you know, how, what is, you know, when you talk to patients, how do you address the alcohol issue? Okay. Well, the first thing is that most patients with liver disease don't drink alcohol. Um, and so they're having to overcome a lot of stigma and myths that their liver disease is, is from alcohol. And they're often not you know, not believed even by, by their doctor. And so uh, that's one thing to just get over the defensiveness to have somebody who believes them, um, you know, and there are um, liver diseases from uh, genetic uh, issues. There are liver diseases from autoimmune issues like I have, there are liver diseases from uh, viral hepatitis, A, B, C, D, E, and, and, and on. Um, and then uh, there are metabolic uh, liver diseases. And then, uh, and then certainly there are alcohol abuse um, uh, induced uh, liver diseases that are getting a lot more research. Um, some of them are are mixed that they can have a metabolic uh, 
function and an alcoholic function, I was most fascinated by people whose own body starts to use yeast in a way that they become their own brewery okay. and, 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 and start making alcohol. And so those poor people are like, I don't drink, you know, like yet you have all this alcohol in your system. And so they have, uh, you know, a particular condition where they have become their own brewery and, and they, and they're making alcohol out of, out of yeast. So I think the number one thing is that most liver disease is not from alcohol, but for those with whom, um, that is the cause of the disease, you know, they deserve treatment just like everyone else. And I think that us being more forward about it means that people need treatment for their alcohol abuse issues, as well as their liver disease. But I think if you certainly want to have optimal liver health, um, you don't drink. Um, or if you're a woman, you have, you know, one, one drink and that's not one ever refilling, you know, uh, restaurant type of drink where it never seems to go down. It's not that, um, it is, it is one drink and for, and for men, uh, it's recently, you know, two, um, and take the time to, you know, go to the sources and, 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 and go to your own cabinets and glassware and, and translate those government guidelines into what it means in your glassware. Cause you're like, I only have one glass of wine. You have one Olivia Pope. One, you know, one glass of wine. <laughs> yes, exactly. This one is water, water by the way. Olivia Pope <laughs> scandal size balloon wine yeah. glass. That that's not, that, that's not what we're talking about. That's not going to help you in the long run. You're not going to be making your best decisions um, based on that glass of wine. And you're not going to have the best uh, lab work or ultrasound um, at the end of the day um, from that type of drinking. And so, you know, everybody these days, uh, you know, needs some type of, you know, self-care. Um, it's not selfish to have self-care. And so what do you do to reduce stress? What do you do to take if it's some, you know, a just a moment away, a breath, um, a walk, a um, I am fond of the battle ropes at the gym. Oh um, wow. <laughs> and so uh that's too many conference calls and I, you know, tell my trainer, I'm like, well, yeah, we're gonna do the battle ropes today. Um and so that's you know, you but you have to do you have to do something. Um and I, I think it's important to acknowledge that for people and we're not just like trying to take take their one coping mechanism yeah. away, but to give them, you know, something something better, something different because we care about them and uh, we care about their, their liver and every other, and every other part and that they're important. But certainly if they already have some type of liver disease, the alcohol is just not your friend, you know? Um, thankfully they're making really cool mocktails um, and, you know, with, with craft ingredients so that you don't have to be left out of the party. Um, and, uh, and, and so I just think it is something that, um, you know, life is, life is worth living for some of us. It's very hard won and hard fought and to, you know, lose that battle over, uh, you know, a glass of wine or a beer or something is really just not, not worth it in the end. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Now, you know, this is such an interesting conversation and I want to give some time to, you know, how is liver disease diagnosed and are there signs and symptoms that we should be aware of or is it something hidden that we don't know? Well, often it, the symptoms of early liver disease are silent um, or are covert. Um, there may be a lot of damage happening in the liver because the liver is very resilient that may not be picked up until very late stages, unfortunately. And so having regular lab work, which includes liver function tests, um, is, is common, um, but not everybody pays attention to them. Or sometimes you may hear uh, your doctor say, oh, your liver enzymes are a little elevated. Well, we'll just watch those. 
actually watch them come back uh, and in, in a shorter time frame, maybe six months instead of a year or three months instead of six months and see if they're still elevated. And if they are, then investigate that with ultrasound or an additional modality so that um, liver disease can be caught early. Because often uh, when caught early, there are many, many things that, uh, that we can do. Um, and so, you know, there are signs uh, like itching um, called puritis, um, but extreme itching can be a sign of liver disease. That's because when, bile is when, backing up into your system. And so where mm-hmm. would you be? Itch- where would you be itchy? Everywhere, the palms of your hands, the palm, you know, the bottoms of your feet. It could be anywhere. Um, but, uh, it, you know, extreme itching is a sign of liver disease well before someone might become jaundiced or become yellow from the bile backing up into their, into their system. Um, fatigue is one of the most, uh, you know, subtle signs, but because the liver is responsible for your energy production, fatigue is one of the signs of liver disease. And so that's why, um, paying close attention and and having this part of, you know, the work of the Global Liver Institute is making sure that there's not just public awareness about liver disease, but specific awareness by physicians so that they're thinking about potential liver disease when they are looking at lab work or they have a person in front of them of whatever age, Um, because, you know, liver disease hits so many people of working age, of childbearing age, um, depending on the disease, that it, it really is something that should be front of mind for every primary care physician, every endocrinologist, um, cardiologist as well, and not just when people have advanced disease and they end up at a, at a hepatologist. Um, it, it really needs to, to be further downstream. And so that's a lot of what we work with, of making sure there's an information on how to identify liver diseases is in the hands of OBGYNs um, because there are a lot of diseases of uh, liver diseases of pregnancy that can be caught um, of infants that can be screened um, of young children um, if identified early enough with biliary atresia can be saved with a procedure. And so it's really the entire medical community, um, including nurses um, who, who need to be you need to have liver on the brain, if you will, um, and be really out there spotting uh, liver diseases in time for us to do something about them. I 100% agree with you, but I'm going to go back and say also patients. As patients, we yes. have a responsibility to really be aware of what's going in our body and put our liver on our brain, get our liver on our brain, because we don't know, mm-hmm. often think about that. We're always like thinking yes. about something, oh, our stomach or this or that, or, you know, this hurts and fatigue. So many Mm -hmm. of us struggle with that. Who would have thought it could be related to your liver? And, you know, again, we could go on and on today, but I really want to go and share with patients with you some of the resources and great things you're doing with the Liver Institute that can help patients become more aware. And also the stuff that you're doing to break down barriers. I know there's lots of access issues and access to care or treatments or even to getting a diagnosis in a timely manner. So what does your organization offer and how can patients access some of these great things that you have? Well, um, globalliver.org is our website and most of our materials come in as many as 18 languages. I really want to give credit to my fabulous multilingual, multicultural staff because it's so important for them to make information in, in languages and in cultures that, that so many patients can access and appreciate. And I love hand delivering our medical education, our patient education pieces all over the world um, so that people know that, that they can download it for free. Um, and, and 
One of the things that stands out for us, I believe, is our Advanced Advocacy Academy. So training patients to be patient advocates so they can go back to their communities, um, to our Liver Action Network member uh, organizations throughout the U.S. and throughout the world, and, and help other patients, um, but also serve on FDA committees and grant review committees and, and really be a force throughout healthcare to make sure that liver health issues are included everywhere they should be. So I think that really is, if I'm known for anything at the end of the day, it, it's it's training more patients to the Advanced Advocacy Academy to be able to identify what people need and continuously solve them. So GLI is what the patients um, make it and it's been evolving for almost 10 years. It will be 10 years next year. And, um, and that's the most exciting thing for me, that whether it's our liver cancer council, our fatty liver disease uh, council, or our pediatric and rare liver disease council, bringing people together, um, we always have patients um, in the leadership positions, identifying issues and marshalling people towards solutions. Fantastic. I had no idea you were that uh, expanded in your patient with the actual the patient groups. Now, do you, can any patient join um, caregivers? Like, who do you encourage yes. to check out and become part Absol of it? Absolutely. Um, we have um, uh, applicants from our uh, A3 program, from patients, caregivers, and also some um, allied health professionals as well. It's fantastic when a transplant coordinator um, wants to participate alongside patients and, and learn. Um, and then all of the rest of our materials um, are available on our website or our Instagram or Facebook uh, for, for free. And if there are languages that we don't yet have it translated into, let us know and uh, we will we will get on that. Um, that and so that and, and, and uh, helping to create more uh, patient organizations and resources in, in countries and communities around the world is really our, our next step. You know, we, we seed um, a lot of different uh, community organizations and help them grow stronger so that there is a liver organization in their country or somewhere closer um, to them um, while we work on large international or federal issues um, like our organ transplant system, which I was testifying before the Senate mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year and successfully had uh, a bill um, passed to reform our organ transplant system. So wow. those are some of the things on a systemic level that we're involved in um, as we help more patients being able to navigate the individual issues that can help them hopefully also reach a 28th transplant anniversary or avoid a transplant altogether. Well, you are an amazing and inspiring individual. You've accomplished so much and you've gone through so much. And we're so grateful to have you on the show today. And our, before we go, you know, again, this is why we should care about our liver. And if you could sum up for patients uh, in a couple sentences or uh, a, a soundbite, like what would you say to them right now? I would say that you're not alone that unfortunately many people um, have liver have liver diseases and we, we have a place for you here at GLI. I would also say that everyone has a liver, so everyone should care about their liver. And uh, you know, if they just step out and 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 say something, they'll realize that there are so many people around them who also have have liver issues and that there's no reason for the stigma that currently exists around liver disease that we're all in it together and we can all make a difference for liver health well thank you donna and thank you to the global liver institute for your really vital resources and all the work you're doing and i hope that we can collaborate on some projects in the future uh thank you again for your time today and uh, wish you well this is thank great. you thank you for listening to the gastro girl podcast for more information and resources please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. 
The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.